begin this course is to try and understand the motivation as to why we want to move to a new architectural style. Right? Um, if, if, if we are all able to buy into the fact that SOA is going to give us something new, is going to give us something that current technologies do not fully address, then I think uh, we would have made a good beginning for the next five days. Right? Without that buy-in, I think uh, you know, it's just going to be very hard for you to sit there and swallow whatever else is going to come beyond this. You know, he's just talking of XML, he's talking of SOAP, he's talking of this. I don't even understand why this is useful. I don't want that scenario. So I think it's useful to spend uh, the first part of uh, this course, especially in the morning, uh, to understand the motivation. So why SOA? What is it going to buy us? Where have we come from? What is it that SOA is changing in this scenario? What is going to be new about it? Right, so that's what we're going to first talk about um, and then we'll introduce, since the course is also specifically going to um, focus on web services as an implementation platform for SOA, uh, we'll talk about what exactly web services are from, from an introductory perspective today morning and then uh, certain XML technologies that underlie or at the heart of all the specifications that we're going to explain over the next three days and therefore we may want to get familiar with um, XML schemas specifically. So many of you may have programmed using DTDs for XML, but uh, you know DTDs are a thing of the past now, and it's being replaced with XML schemas. Um, so we won't discuss the detailed schedule right now. We'll discuss it a little later. But we'll start off with the motivation for why we think service-oriented architectures would be useful. What what is it that they're going to bring to the table that doesn't exist today? I think in order to understand that, it would be good to get a historical perspective, first of all, of where are we coming from, right? And so th th that's going to be this part of the talk. Uh, even before that, let's understand what the challenges in enterprise computing are, right? So these are the standard challenges in enterprise computing that we see. We want systems that are scalable. You know, if you take really large enterprises, Johnson, Johnson, Boeing, um, you know, GM and Ford, who have hundreds of thousands of employees spread over literally hundreds of locations in the world, uh, this is scalability. This is true scalability that we're talking about, right? Or you're talking of websites or e-commerce sites can handle millions of users with thousands of concurrent users hitting this particular site, right? So scalability is a concern. The second thing is that in large enterprises, it's very hard to pin down a particular standard to say everybody shall use Windows something or the other and mandate it at the CIO level and expect that to flow down is not very easy to do, right? There will be pockets which, which have different requirements and therefore organically <coughs> you will expect that certain heterogeneity is going to come into the environment right so diverse environments are going to exist some of the people may even at the operating system level at every level at the op, from the operating system from the hardware onwards um, all the way up the application stack right the third challenge is um, in today's age everything has to go faster right i mean uh, it's not, not going to be able to slow it down so what used to be an 18 month release cycle for software today has shrunk Significantly, uh, people are pushing for three months or less cycles, uh, even though it may not be very practical, but certainly the incremental mode of development where features can be quickly released is becoming the norm, right? Uh, for a while, I think we ended up sitting and complaining as software engineers saying, you know, the quality of software is going to suffer if you do this. Um, if you keep pushing for faster releases and to get more features out in shorter amounts of time, um, then you're going to end up with poorer software. But I think one of the things that we would all realize by now is there's no point complaining about this because this is the way it's going to go, right? This is only going to get worse, if anything, in the future. Um, so I think time to market is going to be a continual issue that we have to deal with. Certainly costs uh, are, are again an issue. And costs can be looked at from two perspectives. The so cost of development, you know, what does it cost to actually put the software out initially? And then more importantly now, uh, it turns out that the cost of development or the initial acquisition of software is turning out to be a smaller and a smaller part of the bigger picture, right? The bigger picture being if I have to run this software for the next 10 years, the cost of operations and maintenance are far outstripping the cost of initially deploying that software onto a particular platform, right? So this OA and M as they call it, this issue in enterprises has kind of overtaken this notion of the cost of development. Right? So those are uh, some of the challenges in enterprise computing. Let's keep that in the back of our mind. Right, so these two, the first two slides are meant to give you an idea of what is it that we want to keep um, in our focus and then look at what the evolution of software platforms has looked like. Right, so enterprise applications, 
themselves are typically made up of these components that you see here, right? So there is uh, three components that we commonly know about. So the presentation logic of the UI is the, the way that people interact with this. Then there's the business logic, which actually holds the code, the business rules type of component, the workflow may exist in there, um, and so on. And then there is the data access logic, because every enterprise system revolves around a lot of data that is stored in, typically in relational databases. Um, and then a, a component that we don't often talk about, a component that we don't often see, are these system services, as I call them. What are these system services? Things like security, things like concurrency management, connection pooling, you know, all of these things that we uh, use quite a bit today, right? These are system services and they did not exist in the form that they exist today. Explicit, uh, being part of the infrastructure, uh, it was actually very uh, embedded in the early days of software development and that slowly started changing. Um, and so we have these four components, right? So the UI, the business logic, the data access logic, the data itself, of course, and I've not explicitly mentioned that, and the system services. So over the next half an hour or so, 20 minutes to half an hour, let's take a look at how have software, uh, how have the software methodologies, how have software systems evolved over you know, the last 15, 20 years? Because I think it's useful to do this from the perspective of it indicates a certain trend. And the logical next step in the trend should really be what we should be seeking, right? So what happens next? If we take a look at this trend, what would be the next step? And if we can answer that with the next step needs to have these features, and those features are SOA for us, right? That's, that's really what we should be looking at. That's why this historical perspective, I believe, is useful. So looking at this, there are actually two axes along which evolution has proceeded, right, within software systems. The first axis is that of, you know, how many changes can I make and how easily can I change the software platform? In other words, how, how flexible is my application platform that I'm deploying it on, right? How, how much does it cost for me to make a change? That is one axis of evolution. And the second axis of evolution is where are these system services that we talked about, where are they coming from? Are they embedded? Are they explicit? Is there infrastructure for it? Or this, it is not something that is uh, standardized, right? So those are some of the issues there. So there are these two axes of evolution. And I think it will become clear as to what I'm talking about if you actually take a look at the different um, incarnations or avatars that we have gone through, right? So these are some of the standard avatars. So we have seen the notion of single tier, two tier, n tier, three tier is just a specific uh, instantiation of that. And even within three tier, we had remote RPC for, I mean, remote procedure calls first and therefore those RPC based systems. And then we moved to more distributed object based systems. And then we moved to web based systems, um, right? Um, finally, we are at this notion of what I'm calling application servers. That's the, the technology that is used today out there in the industry to build applications, right? Initially, there were proprietary application servers, examples being Tuxedo, DCOM, et cetera, and then the things got standardized somewhere along the way. So there was an open standards process that came into being. And so that's where we stand. And so we'll briefly discuss each one of these, right? You're probably familiar with this, right? So we'll go pretty fast here. So single tier, everything is monolithic, right? Everything sits in one place. Um, I have to point to something, but uh, so I guess I stand here and point. So everything sits in one place. These are mainframe based applications, right? All of these three layers of business logic, of presentation logic, of data access logic, and the database itself sat on the mainframe, right? Um, and many of you might have even written applications for the mainframe here. So it's a very centralized model, and it is a very monolithic model. So there are two aspects of it, right? So there's no distribution involved here. Right, everything sits in one place and there are typically dumb terminals that were accessing uh, whatever applications run on the mainframe. Um, and it is also very monolithic. Uh, so COBOL type applications may be uh, using kicks types of infrastructures out there. So it is, uh, the obvious disadvantages of something like this would be what? I mean, you've, you've studied single tier systems before, right? So maintenance <coughs> is very hard. Maintenance is hard? Yeah, there are two aspects to maintenance. I would say it's hard and it's easy. <laughs> Why? Right. The management aspect of it, I think, if you take maintenance to include the management aspect of it, management is much simpler. 
in this scenario, right? Because everything is centralized. It's in one location. Things are not spread all over the place. So even my deployment means I just have to redeploy to that one machine, right? So the, the management aspect of it is much simpler. And so there is no client side management. I have not actually spread the UI on several client machines, so I don't have to redeploy to that, so on and so forth. Right? And clearly, uh, data is all sitting in one place. Data is not replicated, so I don't have to worry about consistency issues. If I change one copy of data, I don't have to worry about the fact that another copy may go out of sync with this and so on. Right? So those are the, the advantages of this kind of a model. Um, and the obvious cons, one is it is monolithic. So making a change is going to be much harder. That's the, the maintenance is harder kind of an issue. Um, and it's all it's all very intertwined in this kind of a scenario. Therefore, making a change is expensive because somebody has to know the whole code well, and the learning curve for that may be pretty high. So every time somebody leaves the company, you're in a whole lot of trouble, right? So that is uh, <coughs> the disadvantage of that. Then we move to two-tier systems where we now had a little bit of distribution going on, right? We pulled some stuff out. We said let the database sit separately, right? Um, and then everything else was wrapped in what we call a thick client solution. It was a fat client which had the business logic, which had the UI, which had data, data access logic which was going and talking to the database. Right? So we were, we were able to split this thing out. And the advantage of this was that it gave us the ability to move from database vendor product to vendor product. Right? So we could, since the database was separate, we could essentially separate the database. Although it was not as simple as today where we have a standard interface to write to a database and no matter which database you're using, that interface is going to work, right? ODBC, JDBC, whatever. Um, it wasn't quite so then, but certainly this gives us the independence to replace the, the database engine itself. There's still a lot of problems with this scenario, right? Um, so the, the, the UI and the business logic were still very in, intertwined with each other. And it was difficult making changes. Certainly deployment was a nightmare because there were thick clients. And right? you had a thousand clients and these things were deployed there. Um, every time you made a change, you had to update these thousand clients. It was very tightly coupled to the data model because all the logic was sitting on the client side. Uh, and every time I made a change in the schema of the data model, then you know I would be in a lot of trouble because it would break all the clients that were out there. And I had to redeploy a change to that. Um, the other thing was scalability. right? Every one of these thick clients required an independent connection to the database. And the database engine you know can only support so many independent connections to it. Right? You have to vertically scale the database engine. There is no horizontal scalability that was affordable at the database side. You can't. Because today the notion of uh, uh, database clusters are now coming into play. But the, again, that's, that's, that's the latest, very latest in database software. Right? So parallel databases, if you will. But that didn't exist at that point in time. So you, you had to throw more and more iron in the database engine in order to support scalability, which was not a very workable proposition, right? Um, and finally, the, the final issue was that you would, it, for chat, all applications would be chatty by nature, right? So it would have to go to the database, come back, go to the database, come back, and if there's a network separating the two, uh, you would be in trouble. So we said, okay, that's not gonna work out as well, so let's distribute things even further. Let's break things apart so that we can independently replace the different piece parts of it without affecting the others. So we went to three tier. Now in three tier what we did was we put the business logic in a middle tier which was then talking to the database. The data access and the business logic sat in one tier um, and uh, the, the UI or the presentation logic sat somewhere else. Right? Um, and there was uh, RPC from the UI to the business logic and then there was SQL uh, which are typically the uh, databases were relational in nature being accessed through SQL, right? The, the middle tier now had to handle all these notions. All these notions of system services now started coming into play, right? Because there was a middle tier, now I had to handle concurrency. There were thousands of clients sitting in the middle tier, right? The database engine which was used to handle concurrency, now is now that, that responsibility got transferred somewhere to the middle tier. The database engine still does handle concurrency, but the, now there's also concurrency management in the middle tier that is required. Right? All authentication may be done by the, the middle tier. The security, because there's a network involved encryption now come, needs to come into play, so on and so forth. Right? With this uh, monolithic mainframe solution, this was not an issue. There was no network really involved. Right? So these kinds of issues come into play. System services now have to be coded. So what are the pros and cons of this? Right? <coughs> so here, the notion was that I would completely insulate the client from the data model. Right? So the MVC paradigm, if you will. Right? So um, I will insulate the client from the data model. So if my schema changes, my client itself doesn't have to change. 
Um, but however, the business logic may change and therefore I will keep the clients completely uh, safe from that perspective. Right? So business logic can also flexibly change. That was another advantage of this uh, without affecting uh, too many of the clients themselves. So there was an interface specification. As long as the clients were hitting that interface specification, it didn't matter. The implementation of the business logic could change along the road. Right? Now it so happened that once I created this middle tier, it became a beast of its own. Right? Now it became quite complex to manage the middle tier and in those days there were no such things as app servers. Right? Therefore the complexity that was being introduced in the middle tier had to be handled by the developers who wrote the applications themselves. Right? That was a, the very early versions of the three tier RPC based systems. Right? Um, and uh, the client and the, the middle tier server uh, were a little more coupled to each other because it was an RPC or a procedural model as opposed to an object oriented model. And also the notion of uh, uh, being able to flexibly replace components, uh, being able to have clear abstractions of functionality which could be you know, taken out and replaced with some other component did not exist in this. Right? So that was the next natural evolution. We moved to a remote object or a distributed object scenario after that. Right? So the business logic and the data were captured in nicely encapsulated entities called objects. And these objects or components as they're called could essentially be pulled out and replaced with another equivalent object that satisfied the same interface specification but could do things differently, whatever. Right? So now you had the, uh, the, the, the notion, remember what we started out with, we said that evolution happened along two axes. One was the axis of how much flexibility I got out of the system. Right? Clearly objects versus procedures, there's a lot more flexibility there because you have these encapsulations that you can uh, replace at will, if you will. That, that was a promise at least. Right? Not necessarily that it was realized fully, but that was a promise. Right? So this notion of reuse also could come into play where a single abstraction that was created could be advertised and reused by many people. Right? So that was the object oriented paradigm, distributed objects. Examples here are RMI and DCOM. Right? I am going to distinguish between RMI and J2EE because J2EE is actually the next natural evolution along the RMI paradigm. RMI came earlier and RMI simply gave you a way of remotely accessing Java objects over a network. Right? So, and so there was some interface language which described these objects. In the case of RMI, the interface language was Java itself. There was, there was no separate interface language. Okay. So the pros here are, it was, it was better than the RPC model because from the coupling perspective and there was a lot more flexibility that was afforded. There were all these data abstractions that were created, abstractions could be reused, therefore the reuse levels went up, right? And there was the situation where you could pull out certain abstractions and replace it with other equivalent abstractions, right? But this notion of middle tier complexity did not go away. If you have an RMI um, application, you still have to manage everything yourself. It's not that uh, somebody is going to manage uh, connection pooling for you. Connection pooling is not a part of RMI, right? It is part of something that you have written because you find that to be useful. I want to multiplex database connections amongst multiple people who want to use the database connection, right? So that is a notion of connection pooling there. <coughs> then actually before we address that, what happened was uh, we were still with thick clients, but then the browser became very popular, right? So we started saying, wait a minute, why don't we simply, instead of having thick clients from the, the client side and having heavy duty boxes, machines, PCs, which have to be maintained, operating systems upgraded every so often, virus containment, all these issues, let me keep a thin client just so that it can run a browser. That is my minimalist thin client, probably boots off a network operating system somewhere so that it is not affected by viruses, right? Um, and all it runs is a browser. That's the only capability that I need of a client. If I have this, I will be able to deliver all my standard enterprise applications over a browser. So that was the three tier or n tier. The three is just a, a metaphor for how many ever tiers you want to have, right? Um, but the, the client was just a browser. So HTML was the standard thing and there was, uh, the browser was talking HTTP to the server. And so even the UI, component of it actually sat on the server. Uh, this is your standard JSP kind of a model, right? Servlets where uh, the UI component sits at the server, is served out of a server, but is simply displayed by a browser, right? So the pros was that the browser is ubiquitous. 
It doesn't matter what operating system you have, it doesn't matter what kind of client you have, whether you have a PC, whether you have a thin client, whether you, whatever you have, whether you have Linux, whether you have Windows, you have a browser. That's all is needed and the browser talks a standard to the backend, which is through HTTP and it understands how to display HTML, which is also a standard. Right? So that is ubiquitous client types. Um, there was no client to manage. Uh, unlike a thick client, I didn't have to deploy software on the client side. Right? Any change I made to the UI was also deployed once on the server and you are done. The next time the client reloaded that page, he got the latest changes. Right? And... Uh, but sir, here infrastructure deployment and sizing also play a key role. Yeah, yeah. So that complexity started... Load balancing and all those issues and performance. Exactly. So, the, in fact, the, one of the issues is the more we started pushing towards the server in the middle tier, the complexity of the middle tier infrastructure services started going higher and higher, right? So, now we had to manage all the issues that you brought up. So, we had to load balance, um, we had to deal with security and, and so on. <coughs> so, that's exactly the point that I was going to make, which is that is still a con of this approach is that you don't have... Um, the complexity in the middle tier has not gone away. So that's an issue that we have not solved. So then we said that along the evolutionary path, so this is the, the summary of the evolution that has taken place up till this point. Right? So we went from single tier to multi tier. We wanted to distribute things so, and we wanted to insulate one layer from another layer. Right? It's kind of like layered software but on, the, on a horizontal level. Right? So you're creating many horizontal layers and the layer on the leftmost end will be insulated from the layer on the rightmost end through intervening layers that, that are sitting in between. So that was uh, one thing that we did. We moved from what is obviously very monolithic software to clear small abstractions that are working together. These are object orientation is what we call it. Um, <clears throat> and this helped give us a lot of flexibility and helped us uh, improve our reuse, which was the two important things. And then we started moving more from thick clients, you know, application clients to more HTML based, web based, browser based uh, front ends. So, so far this has happened. And this is again just a summary of going from single to multi tier, what was the difference, right? This is the two ends of the spectrum, single to multi tier. Um, and we've seen this already. Going from monolithic to go, uh, going to be more object based, what is the difference? So monolithic, there was a single file. Every time you made the smallest change to the application, you had to recompile the entire application and put it out there. That was the notion of monolithic software. And in the case of object based or component based, you have all these small, small parts and you can simply recompile each part and dump it out there, right? So in fact, in the case of Java now, you can even recompile a class and the Java application is running and you can just deploy a class onto a running application. So it will just reload the class and run with it, right? So you never have to even bring down the existing system. Okay, so <clears throat> the outstanding issues, however, that we have not solved so far, which is what our interest is in, is that the middle tier uh, complexity still was very high. In fact, it got worse and worse because middle tier was a beast that we created along the way. It didn't exist earlier, right? So the, this started actually getting uncontrollable and a lot of the system services that were necessary uh, people were inventing on an ad hoc basis. How do I solve the concurrency control problem? Everybody was coming up with their own solution. Every application developer came up with his own solution. How do I do connection pooling? Came up with his own solution, etc. And so this is obviously something that we didn't want. So we said, let's create a common server for this. Right? These are problems that are commonly faced by every enterprise application. So let's dump all this into some kind of infrastructure software. That's what we're going to do. Right? And we call this the app server, or the application server, right? And this was actually a, the notion of a container, right? The, the container notion came along, or it was called a container a little later, uh, but that's essentially what it was. So it was that, you know, I, I had a container, let me just draw. So this actually looked like a bucket or a container, and uh, the container actually gave you certain system services. So these were the API that the the container afforded for the application programs to call. So these are container API and into the container you will drop application components or objects. So this is what it looked like and this container was simply an abstraction for the different system services that were uh, previously being duplicated by various people. Right? So that was the notion. Um, and we had several containers then come up. So there was uh, the notion of Corba, 
which was one of the earliest forms of the container logic. So we moved from the DCOM RMI to J2E slash CORBA slash .NET kind of a, a notion. So this is a container. The container could obviously be either be proprietary or it could be uh, uh, it could be open standards based, right? So anything can be either proprietary or open standards based. Uh, same thing with the container. Um, so the the contract between the the container itself and the application components that recited within the container was well defined, and that was defined either by the vendor of the software. So if Microsoft gave the software and it was uh, .NET that you were buying. Uh, then it, you, you had a particular way of interacting with the .NET API or, or if it was J2E there was uh, some way of interacting with it. The APIs were quite well specified. Um, so some of the earliest ones were Tuxedo also was a container. So it was basically a transaction manager, right? Uh, uh, there was Tix which was another transaction manager that was used here and so on. Uh, the obvious problem of the solution is that there is vendor lock-in. Right? So suppose I go to Microsoft and I am stuck with Microsoft. Once I start building my applications, it does not interact very well with others. I can build bridges from Microsoft solutions to other solutions, but these bridges would be custom uh, bridges that I would have to code in. It does not come with a standard uh, way of interacting with other applications. So I could not have you know, solutions that had TIPCO and Tuxedo talking uh, with Microsoft.NET very easily. So it was not something that I could easily build. Right. So then we said we want an open standards based solution. In fact, the open standards based solution was one of the first things to come up. Right. So uh, if you, how many of you remember CORBA in this space? Anyone if you have worked with CORBA before? There is one person. So uh, CORBA was this uh, standard called the Common Object Request Broker Architecture. Um, and this came out of a standards body called OMG. The same people who put UML out as a standard. Uh, first create, they, they, they weren't in charge of UML earlier. So they started with this distributed object standard uh, which was called CORBA which was nothing but an application server for distributed objects. But their focus was a little different, right? Uh, their focus was actually inter-language uh, interoperability so that you could have clients uh, written in say C++ talking to servers written in Java or whatever other language. Um, and the common meeting point of this was some kind of an interface definition language, a canonical representation of the interfaces. Uh, that both the client and the server side couldn't understand, right? So that was the notion. So it's the same comp uh, the container and the component model that we discussed in the proprietary solution, except that here that uh, contract between the component and the container is an open standard, right? So anybody can implement such a uh, container, and if there was a standards compliant container, obviously I can drop my uh, objects or components into such a thing without having to worry about whether it's going to work correctly or not, right? It will, is the expectation at least, right? That's the notion of a standard. <coughs> um, and the other advantage of open standards based solutions obviously are that I can influence this particular standard, right? So with uh, J2E or with web services today, anybody can essentially go to the, uh, to the standardization committee and say I want a standard for this. Right? So there is such a requirement and if everybody sees this requirement as being a common one, then the standardization process kicks off for that particular uh, requirement. Right? So here are some of the standards. Uh, some people claim that J2E is a Sun proprietary solution. It is not. Um, there is something called a um, Java community process or JCP which allows anybody to float something called a JSR or a service request that will handle standardization of some particular Java feature, right? Anybody can become a, a, a member of the JCP. It's a, it's a free membership from what I know. Maybe industries have to pay a little bit. Uh, but uh, but the, the point is that it, it is open, right? So anybody else will be able to influence the standard as well, right? Um, an advantage, of course, uh, with the Java side is that there is portability of code because everything is Java based and, and so on. Um, but you don't have to stick to that. That's just a, that's a happenstance. So, uh, so far, this is the, this kind of completes our historical look at where we stand today, right? This is roughly uh, the scenario where we have this notion of application servers, right? They're open standards-based container component contracts that are defined. Right? And you can write enterprise applications. In fact, most enterprise applications written are written based on these kinds of standards and deployed. 
um, and we have the system services have been well enough studied and uh, we, we have solutions that are out there that address these problems of scalability, address these problems of heterogeneity and to some extent if you use Java the issue of portability is also solved for you. Right? In fact, one of the advantages of an open container is that it's, things are portable. Right? So if you, if you have for example a Corba based application and today my Corba vendor is going to be somebody or even J2E for that, for that matter. Suppose IBM is my J2E vendor right? with WebSphere then I can have a WebSphere based solution. IBM makes me mad for whatever reason. Nobody from IBM here, right? Um, and so I can tell IBM, you know, get lost. I don't want to deal with you. I am uh, in fact going to switch to web logic. Uh, and they are also a J2E compliant container as a result of which I can take my application which was running on WebSphere, drop it into the J2E container and everything will work when I go from vendor to vendor. That's one of the advantages, right? That's, that's the aspect of portability that will exist for you. All right. So that's the, what have we not solved is then the question that comes up. Remember what we started out with. What are the challenges in enterprise computing? That's what we started out with. These were three of the challenges, but there were some more going forward. Right? So what did we not solve? Do you remember what the others were? <laughs> Forgot. Cost, Cost of maintenance. Yeah. Cost of deployment and ownership and maintenance was, was a major issue, right? Hmm? The middle tier logic is expensive, but it has kind of solved some of the problems. So we, we have middle tier logic, which is the application server logic that we have. It has solved some problems. It has solved a scalability problem. So you have um, enterprise applications deployed that have hundreds of thousands of users accessing it today. So eBay, for example, runs on J2EE. Right? eBay is a huge company in terms of uh, the number of people hitting it. So all their uh, back-end enterprise applications are written using J2E. Uh, so that issue of scalability, heterogeneity, etc. has been solved right, with the military logic. So one thing that we did not solve was the time to market issue. We, do, we, we, we kind of made things much more flexible than they were before. But today what happens when you develop an application is that you have a component. Let's say that you're going to reuse a lot of stuff, which is great, right? This is the best possible scenario is that you're reusing a lot of stuff. So you bring the component in house, right? And now you have to write glue code or integration code for these components to work together, right? So for example, let's say you have a standard enterprise solution. It has billing, it has order management, it has trouble ticketing. This is stuff that you should be seeing in every enterprise, right? Um, so you buy a billing solution off the shelf, you buy a trouble ticketing solution off the shelf, you buy some order management solution off the shelf, inventory solution off the shelf. But how are these things going to be made to work together? It's still an open issue, right? It's not true that everybody is going to be writing J2E application, therefore you can get a billing J2E application, a, a inventory J2E application and so on, right? So you may have SAP, you may have... Uh, uh, some the portal for billing, etc., etc. You bring all these in house. You have to still write code, right? Which I call glue code or integration code. You have to integrate these applications. That involves. So that's why people, the whole brand of people who come up are called systems integrators, right? These are the people who sit and write integration code. They design integration strategies for these things, and it's all point-to-point -point integration, right? So every time I build a solution, I buy a solution. I will have to build bridges for this solution with whatever else I have in-house already. It's point-to-point -point integration, right? So it quickly, go in, a, in a large enterprise, which may have hundreds of applications, in fact, there was a survey done at uh, Boeing a couple of years ago, where they found that they had something like 1,700 enterprise applications deployed at various places within Boeing, various sectors. 1,700 applications. A lot of these were talking to each other through point-to-point -point interconnections that had been made. Just try to imagine what the picture is going to look like. It's a nightmare to manage, right? So there are lines going from, it's, it's like a fully connected graph, hardly something that we want, right? So we want a bus instead of a graph, right? Where everybody can talk to a bus. So the, the notion, the, the point I'm trying to make is this time to market issue has still not been resolved because we are sitting and integrating stuff every time. Even though we have these nicely encapsulated components that we can reuse, we still have to integrate them, right? That's not going to come for free. And that will affect time to market. So that's, I believe, we have not solved the issue because of that, right? 
So I know, notice that I have kind of removed the cost of development aspect of it here because we have we have come a long way in server side component models today. Right? We don't have to code a lot of the system services; they come coded for us. Um, it, it, in fact, it's pretty easy to write a J2E application today. Right? From purely from a functionality perspective, it's not that hard to write one of these applications. So, the, however, the cost of operations and maintenance still remains. I have to deploy all these applications myself. Right, which means I need to figure out all the hardware sizing requirements, blah, 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 myself. Capacity management, which is a huge issue if, I, if I'm going to scale. Um, <clears throat> and I have to host all these things. Every time an upgrade of a database takes place, I have to get the upgrades, I have to install it, I have to shut the whole thing down. It's kind of a mess. It's not that easy to deal with. In fact, most enterprises that you will talk to today should be reflecting this picture, especially people who are out there in NIC, for example, in Wipro, a couple of people here. This picture should be what you're seeing. And if it's not, then you should, uh, let's talk about it. Because that's, it's important for me to understand this as well. Right? <clears throat> so this is an issue that's not solved. Above all, there is something else that is going on that has changed the way we do business that current application architectures have not taken into account. Right? Remember, we've talked about the notion of B2B earlier, right? So B2C and B2B. You have all heard of these terms. Business to business and business to consumer. Now, business to consumer, we've kind of solved this. Web-based application, we have it out there. We have a web-based front end. Any consumer can hit it from over the internet. Great. Fantastic. But business to business is not as simple to solve. It's a, it's a different proposition. Now you need to have machine to machine interaction which can understand what is going on. I need to be able to call on some functionality that is sitting beyond my enterprise boundary. There are different enterprise boundaries and now my business process is actually going to cut across these enterprise boundaries. It no longer is my business process confined to my enterprise today. Right? So the question is, and if you are going to collaborate via the internet, has the, have the solutions that we have today, are they able to take advantage of the internet? Are they even able to work over the internet would be the next question that we had to ask ourselves. So I, I don't believe so, and we'll discuss why, but this is, these are some of the issues that are not yet been done, right? So it leads us to the next natural evolution of this notion of distributed object-based app servers or component-based app servers. What is it going to look like? It has to solve these problems, right? In a nutshell, that is what SOA is, right? For, for me, that's what SOA is in a nutshell. Um, at least in the industry, you may hear various terms about, oh, SOA is not a technology, it is not a methodology, it's some way cloud, you know, that's out there, and you've got to be doing it. How do I do it? Uh, you know, hire us and we'll help you solve the problem, is the, <laughs> the typical response that you get. Um, what we, we are going to try to do here over the next five days is to kind of debunk that myth so to speak, right? It is something specific, otherwise there's no point in talking about it, except to make money, which is okay, nothing wrong with doing that, but you shouldn't be making money in trying to scare people.